adore you. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of ministering these precious treasures from your treasury to thy people, these treasures old and new. Hallelujah. Father, I just ask that again tonight you'll give your people hearing ears, that you'll open up their spiritual understanding, and that you'll help me and open up my spiritual understanding that I'll be able to speak those things that are hard to be uttered that I've never said before, Lord Jesus. Just help us all, I pray, that we'll receive that which is our portion from you this night. In Jesus' name I ask. Hallelujah. Well, I told you before, I'm practicing on you. This is the first time I've ever ministered uh, this particular word. Um, last January the 15th, I ministered on the resurrection in um, California. There was a group there, much like you here, that are, are fairly mature, that they could handle this. And it was the first time I had done it, and I felt a little intimidated, but it was wonderful, and they were so precious to receive and encourage me. So this is the first time again to share the laws of paradise. And I'm so glad that he chooses such and ones as yourself that um, I don't ever see any of you look at me you know, kind of sideways or she is off the wall or whatever. <laughs> you just say, hmm, your eyes widen and wow, <laughs> this is good stuff. So for those who may not have been here at all, this is what the Lord has had me share. I'm sharing, I shared on Thursday night on the Sabbath rest, the com coming into the rest of the Lord, ceasing from our own labors, and that is a must to enter into this new day. And so um, from there I've gone into the laws of paradise that the Lord gave to Jane Lead, um, a prophetess in England in the late 1600s. And uh, the Lord gave her many wonderful foretastes and experiences and understandings of the day in which we live. And he told her that there's going to be a virgin church come forth in the last days. And she said, at this present time, like in 1670, there is no such thing anywhere to be seen as this virgin church. But it shall be coming forth under the hands of God. And the Lord is going to use them to bring in this new day of the kingdom of God. And so um, the other night, while I was ministering, um, Sister Linda there had um, a vision, and she saw um, sheep, the sheep of the Lord gathered together under the, the shepherd at high noon. And you know that verse in the, the Song of Solomon, it is so precious. The bride is saying to the shepherd, she said, to him, tell me, uh, where do your flocks feed at noon? And he said to her, and I'll, I'll just say this in my own words, he said, if you don't know, you might as well go back to the churches. <laughs> if you don't know where they are eating at noon. So the Lord gave her this vision of the shepherd going uh, through them and, and among them um, with his uh, mighty presence. And so we're, we are uh, this sheep here, coming to that place of spiritual understanding, a high place. Noon is the time when there's no darkness. And he's bringing us to that place where we are beginning to discern between flesh and spirit, soul and spirit. And we know what is uh, the portion from our God. Hallelujah. So, going into the laws of paradise, we went into um, 1 to 7 already. And I wish I could repeat uh, a little bit some of those from the others, but I have too much to cover tonight because if, if this is an experiment and I'm practicing on you, I've got to finish. Is that okay? If I do? <laughs> All right. Well, that's... Oh, okay, good. Well, I don't mind if you take my picture now as long as you don't wait till I'm taking a big bite of cake or something. That's what people <laughs> usually do. <laughs> So we're going to, um, the Lord showed Jane Lee, he caught her up into a realm of spirit called paradise and showed her that the commandments that were given to Moses were, um, I will say this part for, from myself, not from Jane Lee. The commandments were never intended to be kept so that you'd have brownie points with God. Well, I can keep all the commandments. I remember 
uh, being invited out for supper once years ago and there was an older gentleman there and because my hostess and her husband were Christians I assumed he was also he was a relative of theirs but he was not he was an older man but he was not a Christian I started talking freely about the Lord and he we're sitting on the sofa together starts moving away from me and I thought dear me what's the matter I didn't think I ate garlic that morning or anything why doesn't he like to be close to me <laughs> he moved away and then he said as if to settle the matter said I'll have you know I keep all the commandments never murdered anybody never committed adultery or anything like that he said I guess I'm as good as the next one I'll surely make it I don't need this Jesus whoa thought, wow this is not um, anyone who knows God so I shut up very quickly but I pondered that in my heart he was telling me in no uncertain terms if I keep the commandments I don't need Jesus and there are a number of people who feel that the commandments are something to be kept so that they can um, win favor with God not at all you look at the commandments of uh, Moses and you will see they all show us what God is like and they show us what God is like because God is saying this is how I want you to act I don't want you to covet I don't want you to steal or lie or commit adultery I want you to love me with all your heart all the things that he says are things that he is like he's telling us I won't ever lie to you I won't ever be unfaithful to you I'll never do anything to hurt you I'll always love you and so the commandments show forth his nature and of course they couldn't keep them back there and we can only keep them by the Spirit of the Lord within us keeping them so he is writing them upon the fleshy tables of our hearts and he's taking those Ten Commandments and he's raising them up and saying see what they really mean in the Spirit of course you don't want to do any of those carnal things like coveting stealing lying and so on but it's much higher in the Spirit of God the attitudes and the motives and things the Lord is getting at that's what I'm talking about tonight so the eighth commandment is thou shalt not steal now this relates first to God and then to the world and the father appropriates unto himself that which he will not give to any much less be robbed by any but what do you think that is you, he has freely given us all things but there is one thing that he will not give us and he will not permit us to rob him of. it is his Godhead which none are to assume to themselves after any manner whatever it is a high sacrilege to steal this honor away from that holy being to whom only it belongs. Um, the past year and a half, I have been dealing much with um, New Age doctrines that are creeping into the kingdom message. And some of the messengers have been bona fide ministers. They know the truth. They're saved and filled with the Spirit of God but uh, they're just bringing in this mixture and uh, <clears throat> a year and a half ago I woke up in the morning and the Lord spoke to me Elaine you're a watchman upon the wall I said yes Lord uh, I know that you've told me that before and others have said it but I waited I wonder why are you saying this to me he said and you have a straight nose oh, okay <laughs> and in the Old Testament a man could never qualify although he was of the priestly family he could never qualify to be a priest if he had a crooked nose or a flat nose that that had some fault with his smeller because a nose speaks of discernment the Lord said you have a straight nose you can discern and you're a watchman on the wall and I had already discerned something on this uh, particular website that was very new agey the Lord said I want you to deal with that and so I did and the party to whom I spoke said no I, I can't can't take that off he said actually I uh, I think New Age has a lot of truth actually I think New Age has more truth than Christianity well that didn't do very much for me but at that time 
the Lord spoke to my heart, as a watchman upon the wall, it is your responsibility to cry aloud and to warn of the enemy that cometh to deceive, kill, and destroy the humble faith of my children and place before them the Godhead, which is not theirs to have. And the biggest thing about New Age, if you don't know anything about it, is they believe that in self they are God. To me it's not new at all. It's just the same old snare that Adam got himself into. Wanting to be God without yielding to God, independently of him. And so the New Agers say, well, I am God and you are God. Oh my word. I remember being invited to a place in North Carolina to a home. The husband had problems and wanted us to come and stay a few days and, and uh, pray for the husband. We were only in the house five minutes and the lady put on tea and we sat down and uh, she's pouring tea and she announces to me, she said, um, I am that I am. I just about fell off my chair. But oh my word, what have we gotten ourselves into? They were so deep in New Age. I asked them what, um, what they were believing and she gave me their books. I stayed up half the night reading them. And the next day, my brave husband, he, he doesn't seem very strong and brave. He's slight of build and, and kind of a fearful person, but he will stand for God. And they wanted to take us all over town and show us the flowers at the university and whatnot. He said, I'm sorry, he said. I can't go around here pretending everything is okay and go and look at flowers, he said, when everything is not okay. He said, you're deeply in something that is far from the gospel, and I want to pray for you. Well, they were not at all um, impressed that we wanted to pray for them. They thought they were true and right, and we were um, not with it yet. To make a long story short, we prayed for them with the not much response and then we agreed to go and look at the flowers but at supper time we had our supper and then they brought on the dessert and the man who had been um, in uh, trouble he started groaning and and um, a crying and, and making quite a fuss at the table we thought what is going on so one of the sisters that were accompanying us went over to him and started um, rebuking the enemy and one spirit after another just came out of him. Oh, it was something. And she said, now when you wake up in the morning and any of these lies come against you or come to you that, like they had thrown away the Bible, that old black book of death, they said, and all this sort of thing. Any of these lies come to you as soon as you wake up, you stand upon the blood of Jesus. Bring the blood of Jesus against it and refuse them not. And when he woke up, the lies were right there trying to come back. He just resisted them and refused them. But the wife was angry with us, and we had to um, hastily pack our bags and go on our way. But two years later, we got a letter from them, which I should have framed. It was so beautiful. They said, the Lord has restored us. We are back again with our Father. We are back again reading the Bible and rejoicing in Him. And we see that we definitely went off the track. And we are so sorry. But they said, we want to thank particularly Bill that he had courage to stand up to us when we weren't very nice to him. Uh, and they have been uh, some of our precious uh, supporters the rest of this time. They're always there for us. If I have a need at any time, the Lord will often speak to their hearts and they don't know about it. <laughs> it's really precious. So I know where I speak here. And this is basically the New Age doctrine. I am God and you are God. I've been in kingdom meetings where well-known ministries have said that to the people in conclusion well i am god and you are god and all the young people would say hallelujah praise the lord oh isn't this wonderful get the break huh? oh goodness the godhead is not ours to have if you try to take it you're stealing from god and god said thou shalt not steal do you hear this if you hear anybody saying it oh you're a thief what do you mean I'm a thief? I never stole from anybody. You're stealing from God that which is his right alone. You're stealing his Godhead. You have no right to take it. You have no right to elevate yourself in that manner. He will not give it to any man. It is a high sacrilege to steal this honor away from that holy being unto whom only it belongs. Can you say amen to, be, to that? 
we may say, oh, far be it from me to rob the Most High of his honor. But Adam was guilty of subtle deceit and we have all inherited it. By his act of disobedience, he stole from his maker the glory of his sovereignty and would have assumed the Godhead to himself by going forth into a divided essence to be wise in the property of self. He wanted to have all the good things of God, but on his own terms. And so he wanted to be divided. He wanted to know all about this knowledge of good and evil here, but he still wanted to have all the freebies and all the good things from God. But when he came into a divided uh, essence to be wise in the property of self, you know what happened? He had committed high theft in paradise and he crept out in the divided property away from God. Breaking unity with God, he lost his godlike power and dignity. The moment that he decided to be his own God, God caused him to fall and he fell into this sense realm which has been such a curse to us all. But under God, he was to have ruled like a God, freely and unfettered, and he did so until it was most cowardly lost. That's the story of Adam, but that's the story of our life also. And those same temptations um, have been in us. Now, we are walking in the divided essences, divided properties, um, this Adam man desiring the things of um, the senses, the things of the external, and then we have the Christ in us, that new man wanting the things of um, our Father. So how do we unite these divided essences? The Lord was speaking to Jane Lead and said, return to him and work in an undivided spirit. In other words, let your eye be single. Not uh, concerned about your own way, but concerned about his way. Father, what would you have me to do? What is your good pleasure? And let the Spirit work to recover all the lost goods in you, which the subtle servant and the harlotry spirit of this world has cheated your God. And cease from eating of the forbidden tree. Live by the Spirit of, of faith, the key of faith which opens the doors in the spirit and unites those divided essences. So this may seem like um, hard things to hear, so I'm kind of going to break it down a little bit here. Return to the Lord and work in an undivided spirit. And so we, we don't want to be tossed and torn while um, being concerned with the things of this life and, and worried about them. Get your, your thoughts together. Father, I'm yours. I'm keeping my eyes on you, and you'll take care of, of the rest of the things. Cause your eye to be single before your Father. Come again into that undivided portion. Hallelujah. And cease from eating of the forbidden tree. Say, well, Elaine, you're, you're kind of talking a little out of it here because that was 6,000 years ago and this is the 90s, almost the 2000s here. What do you mean I'm going to eat of that tree? The tree is yet with us. Every day we wake up, Adam is yet with us. And we have the same choices every moment of the day as Adam had. Which tree are you going to eat from today? Are you going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And it wasn't an apple. It was the knowledge of good and evil. Or are you going to eat from the tree of life? Every hour, every minute, you choose which tree you're going to partake of. Are you going to walk in the mind of reason, the carnal mind, or what your senses tell you? Or are you going to look to the mind of Christ? Father, what do you say about this? What is your heart in the matter? Hallelujah. The Lord uh, puts on my heart to, uh, to tell you something here, just briefly. Uh, so, uh, some years ago, Bill and I were seeking the Lord for uh, maybe 10 days, just mightily. That's all we were doing. We didn't go anywhere. We just prayed and fasted, sought the Lord. And at the beginning of that time of prayer, I had a vision. In the vision, I saw, um, I saw the Lord 
and Bill and I were in his arms, just like little dolls, we seemed so small, and we were being held close to his bosom. I thought, oh, how nice to be close to the bosom of the Lord, to be held close to his heart. But my understanding was unfruitful. He didn't tell me what that meant. I just felt kind of good about it, but that was all. So after 10 days of praying, and this was our last day that we were going to do this, again, I saw the Lord with holding us in his arms like that, and I saw us go right into him. And I saw myself looking out from inside of him, looking out through his eyes, seeing everything as he saw it, and hearing with his ears how he heard things, and understanding and feeling from his heart. I thought, wow, this is good stuff. And then he spoke to me and he said, all through this dispensation, this church age, um, I have been teaching my people what it is like to have Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're on the outside, yes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But in the next dispensation, in the next age of the kingdom of God, I'm going to show you what it's like to be in Christ. It's different. <laughs> Seeing things with his eyes. Knowing from his heart how he feels about a matter. Hearing it as he would hear it. You like that? Oh, that's where we're going. So in order to unite these divided essences that have robbed God of uh, his inheritance, have robbed us of the things that God has for us, we have to have a single eye. Hallelujah. Be undivided once again. But no, I don't want to be like you in my own do-it-yourself kit, Lord. No, I can't do it. I just want to be like you as you make me like yourself, as you write upon the fleshy tables of my heart with the finger of God. To write your nature upon my heart. Hallelujah. So then we go on to um, the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And I want you to know if the Lord says, don't speak falsely against your neighbor, you can be sure the Lord is saying, I will always be true to you. I'll never be false against you in any way at any time. Because that's showing us his nature. So now, if you're not to bear false witness against your neighbor, you need to know who your neighbor is. So who is my neighbor? This is what the Lord told uh, Jane Lead who her neighbor was. He said, he is that true Samaritan who poured in the oil and wine for your healing. Who has taken care of you and undertaken your cure when he saw you wounded and to death. His eye pitied you as one with a fellow feeling of your suffering under the violence of cruel spirits under whose power you had fallen. So the neighbor is the true Samaritan, which is the Lord Jesus, who poured in oil and wine and healed us. And he said, I'll take care of the rest when I come. <laughs> yes, he did. If there's anything else, I owe you, I'll, I'll look after it. We are to bear a true witness to this true spirit of wisdom dwelling in us. We're not to be false to him. His son shall be a true witness of Jesus to the world, not simply in words, but in nature. They have heard enough of words, and the words that they heard have been so negative and so death-dealing, and making God out to be some a terrible tyrant and a cruel despot and dictator. If I believed uh, that God was like many portray him, I wouldn't want to serve him either. I really wouldn't. But I often say to my husband, if the people in the world ever knew the nature of our Father, they wouldn't help but love him. They just couldn't help but fall down at such a wonderful, uh, well, I don't have words to say, our wonderful Father. And so because they haven't heard anything but words, and the words have often been cruel and condemning, they need to finally see a true witness of the spirit of wisdom in us, not just in words, but in nature. I've heard people, even since I've been here, saying that the Lord has put them in places. They didn't even say a word, but they just loved. And uh, the other person was moved and blessed and saw God in them. That may be the case that he won't give us any words, but we're going to be um, in that place 
that they're going to feel the reality of the Spirit of Christ. So we are charged to wait upon this change in ourselves so that we may be eyewitnesses of Jesus in our own person. Now they were happy, the disciples were glad to be eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. And they were glad to report that they had seen the risen Lord. But you know, we are charged by the Spirit of the Lord to wait upon this change in ourselves so that we may be eyewitnesses of Jesus in our own person. Does that blow you away or what? Oh, oh, oh. Not only that, we are to know him as neighbor wherever he dwells bodily. In each one of you, we are to know him as our neighbor in each of his, each member of his body. We are to show the same love and care for another's needs as God gives to us. Because we are to see Jesus in them. We are to know that they are our neighbor in particular because they are him. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. You like that one? I like it. <laughs> and the 10th commandment, take a deep breath. Thou shalt not covet. This is the last charge running parallel with those of the Old Testament laws. The law was given to point out the, in, the complete inability of the natural man to live according to it. But the natural man couldn't keep those things that are the attributes of God. We can't do it. Only by his spirit. His spirit is going to do that and write them upon the fleshy tables of our hearts so that we can't function in any other way but a godly way because it's there. I'm sure that you all have opportunity from time to time, maybe in a store someone makes the wrong change or something, and um, I've known Christians when that has happened, they say, oh, look, the Lord blessed me, they gave me two dollars extra, oh, isn't this great? Uh, uh, no, you come to a place, no, 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 that isn't the Lord, you take it back and tell them, even if they don't know about it, you take it back and you tell them, sorry but uh, you gave me too much money. I do that from time to time. Even if I have to send it in the mail, it absolutely blows people away. I had one businessman, I had bought some business supplies and they just had a new, new lad on the floor and he uh, really gave me a bargain. <laughs> and I recognized that when I saw my bill when I got home, so I phoned and uh, asked them what the true price was. I sent the check in the mail. And the manager himself phoned me, he said, this, this just doesn't happen to us. I said, well, um, I'm a Christian and uh, I do everything in the light of my father and I wouldn't want to disappoint him by stealing from you. And he said, oh, ma'am, I appreciate that very much. I hope you'll continue to come to my store, which I do. And so just little things like this, you know, um, we're to be a true witness to the spirit of wisdom within us. Not in word, but in the nature of Christ. And so, uh, if he's written that in your heart, thou shalt not steal, whether it's in the spirit or whether it's in uh, the mammon of this world, there's no desire there to do it. It just isn't your nature at all. You'd no more want to do that than fly to the moon. Isn't that good? It just isn't, isn't uh, anything of your heart. Thou shalt not covet. And it was a spiritual commandment. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Romans seven twelve gives us that word. What the carnal man could not accomplish according to carnal commandments, God does by writing the same laws upon the table of our heart by his spirit. And we know that Christ is a fulfillment of that law as he lives out his life in us. And as he lives out his life, he writes in us his nature. He writes in us all those commandments. But we're no longer just, just keeping them according to a natural sense. We now know there's more to stealing and adultery and all those things than just a physical thing. We know it's now toward our God that we ought not ever to steal from him and, and commit adultery. We now know this on a higher level. This is what he wants us to understand 
These are called laws of paradise because paradise is the realm of spirit where Jesus walked when he walked on this earth. This is the realm that Adam walked in before he fell. This is the place that the Lord is taking us and we need to know the laws of the land. Remember one time when the um, Israelites or the, the Jewish people, I think it was, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, had uh, gone into Babylonian captivity. And um, the, uh, the enemy uh, moved in some other people into their towns to take their place of all these nice uh, houses. Might as well move our own people in there. And you know, when they did that, these people, um, they finally came to their governor and they said, we are having a hard time. We are overrun with the beasts of the field. They're coming out of the the jungle and, and the, the forest and, and they're overrunning us and they're, they're threatening us and we don't know what to do about it. So they got their heads together and they said, we don't know the ways of the God of this land. So we need to get some of those people to come back here and live among you and teach you the ways of the God of this land. And so they did. They brought back some of the, the remnants of the tribe of Benjamin and Judah and settled them in among these people. And so they weren't troubled anymore with the beast coming in. The beast is the, um, the carnal nature rising up because they didn't know the laws of the land. So we're coming into a new land and we need to know the laws of this new land. What does God now expect of us? We know that certain, certain kind of behavior was uh, what he required of us in the church age but we're coming up higher what is it now lord that you require of us and expect of us and so this is what god is wanting me to share with you here christ is the fulfillment of that law as he lives out his life in us so thou shalt not covet what is it we're not supposed to covet in this high realm of god we are forbidden all coveting desires after that which is the possession of another. Now this is whether in the natural or whether in the spiritual. You can, um, you can admire something that someone has in the natural, but not to covet it. You can look at another person's ministry and think, oh, I would like to be able to do that, or, or maybe uh, their musical talent or whatever. Ooh, and you might covet that or envy them or something. The Lord said, don't do it because each person has their own gifts and their own abilities. And if you'll just dig your well a bit deeper, you're going to find what the Lord has for you, what is your own ability. And he wants us to be satisfied with whatever portion he gives us. Look in the, in the Old Testament when the tribes were given their possession in the new land. Some had... Um, greater possession than others. Remember um, Caleb, it says that he had the higher springs and other springs, he had high springs and, and very desirable places. And, uh, and others had um, maybe uh, more humble places of um, their possession. But the Lord said, I choose a person's place. I choose. And you don't know those who um, you are envying Maybe if you were in their shoes, you wouldn't want to be there at all. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't be nearly as much fun as you thought it was. <laughs> so the Lord said, don't covet another's place or anything that is the possession of another. Just bless them that they have whatever they have that, that you think is lovely. So now we're going to look again at this neighborhood. The Lord is showing her there is a threefold neighborhood. First of all, there is Jesus existing bodily in us. Remember we said he was the, the true Samaritan, the good neighbor. So uh, Jesus existing bodily in us is our first neighborhood. The second neighborhood is Jesus in your brother. And the third one was to me quite amazing. The third neighborhood is your outward man who as Esau desires his birthright is rejected and must live by his sword. Now I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, the blessing of Esau is what? Fat things of the earth, outward principles. He is not to meddle with Jacob's portion, the dominion and lordship over all through living together with God. Now I'm going to explain this to you. This recently happened at my home. I had a young couple 
come to stay for the weekend. I know them quite well. They're only they're just newlyweds. Have a little girlie about a year old, and and they are just so precious in the Lord. Both of them just going on in the kingdom of God, just in a precious way. But they weren't at my home very long when I realized the wife was unhappy. And when her husband went for a walk or something, she said, Elaine, um, I'm just not happy. She said, I've lost my beautiful husband. Um, you know, he used to be so loving and so caring and so kind. And now um, he's got into too much work. He has this job, but he's getting into the Internet and doing um, Internet selling. Or what do you call that? Or whatever. Okay, doing internet commerce there, uh, e-commerce, and he's getting carried all away with this, going to meetings and traveling here and there. And he's getting so worn out that um, we don't have any fellowship anymore, and he's getting cranky and critical, and he's just not my husband, and I'm not happy, and I don't know what to do about it. So I said, well, I'll just talk to Jesus about it. I thought to myself, I don't want to call this man aside and, um, you know, call him on the carpet or something. I don't want to do that. I said, Father, you just make a way here. You just give me wisdom how to deal with this. So one evening, I was sitting at my desk working away, and um, he was sitting across from me at my computer, just messing around a bit. And finally, he swiveled his chair around. He said, uh, Elaine, have you got time to talk for a few minutes? I swiveled my chair around. I said, I sure do. I always have time to talk. What's the problem? He said, um, well, I'm, I'm not very happy. He said, I just feel like I'm suffering burnout. And he said, and I'm afraid of my job that maybe I'll get um, canned or, or um, done away with very shortly or something. I'm not just um, able to concentrate on it that well. And I guess I'm not too happy at home. And I don't know. Uh-huh. I said, okay, Lord, thank you. I said, let's pray. I don't know what the answer is. Let's pray. And when we prayed... The Lord spoke to my heart, and he said to this young man, he said, I have not given you the blessing of Esau. The blessing of Esau is this. Okay, I'll first say Jacob's blessing. Jacob's blessing, he was given first the treasures of the things of the new from heaven. Treasures of spiritual things. And secondly, treasures of the earth beneath. And so when Esau cried the blues because he wanted a blessing also from his father Isaac, the Lord gave, uh, Isaac gave him a very similar blessing, but first of all, he was given treasures from the earth beneath, and secondly, the treasures of the dew of heaven. So the first word the Lord gave me was, I have not given you the inheritance of, Joseph, of um, Esau. I've not given you the treasures of this earth. Be satisfied with your job. Do the very best that you can and don't try to, I've got to get ahead and I've got to make more money and so on. Because in getting ahead, you're, um, you're wrecking your peace and your health and making your wife unhappy. And there was another word he gave me to this young man. He said, uh, you know, when they went into battle, uh, sometimes the Lord would say, I want all the gold and silver and bronze and certain metals. He said, all of these I want you to save, especially when they came into the land and uh, they took uh, Jericho. Remember Jericho? They were to save all those things. They were not to hoard them. So the Lord said, these are, de are devoted to me. And so that was when Achan hit them in the, in the tent and so on. But de to be devoted to the Lord means they are chosen for the Lord's purposes. Whatever the Lord wants to do with them, that's up to him, but man is never to take it and to use it for his own purposes. If something devoted to the Lord, it's his to do it as he pleases. And the Lord spoke to me, he said, you have been devoted to the Lord. You have been given to him in a special way that you can't run your own life, say, I'll do this and that and something else. You are given to me in a special way that only I am to say what you're gonna do. Whoa, whoa. Well, we prayed on that order, and the next day his wife came to me and said, she said, Elaine, I've got my husband back. <laughs> I was so thrilled. I was so happy. And so this was part of his neighborhood. His Esau portion was trying to uh, come to the preeminence, although he loved God. He's Jacob in there too, but the Esau portion was trying to come to the preeminence and, and, and get in there and do his thing and try to meddle with the Jacob portion. And the Lord said, 
I'm not giving you Esau's portion. Put it aside. That's not for you. I'll give you enough provision. I'm not going to rake you rich. That wasn't my plan. Is that all right? It might fit somebody here. <laughs> oh, glory to God. What Jesus has in you, you need not have it. For you are in ownership with him. All that he has is yours. We cannot give our eye freedom to look upon another's portion as to eternal possessions. Everyone with is to be contented with their lot as it is divided. Even though you see another greatly increased in the things of the Spirit, you are not to covet. And uh, rest deep in your own ground until your own fountain opens up and you find that stone with your name on it. Hallelujah. Can you do that? <laughs> Covet not another's crown, because the Lord has enough to give to everyone. There's no need of grudging against one another. And then there is another caution that the Holy Spirit gave her in that realm concerning our outward birth neighbor. That means uh, the people in the field or the world who don't know the Lord. Do not covet that which is that person's right by this outward principle by which he has a great lordship over all that the visible earth brings forth. Now, uh, a person in the world, oh, they can prosper and have money galore and, and, and waste it. You know, and you think, well, why don't they give some of that to the Lord? Well, here, Lord, I'm, I'm in need, and, and, and look, all that you've blessed them with. Well, you know, um, that's an outward blessing, and that's given to an outward man. And this world is a temporal kingdom, consisting in riches, honor, and majesty, with dominion over men. And the Lord said, from which I have set you free. <laughs> I've set you free from that. And you want to have it? Oh my, because if you have it, uh, you'll have the same headaches and problems. Not to say that the Lord cannot give a Christian wealth, but I believe that um, when he does that, he usually does first uh, a work and a purifying in the heart so that he can handle and not keep it unto himself or his own honor and glory. I really feel that's a, a, a special responsibility. And so I thought that was so good. He has delivered us from this temporary, this temporal kingdom. Now, that is all the Ten Commandments, but now we come to the interesting part. Well, one of the interesting parts. When uh, Jane Lead had received these um, laws, spiritual laws in paradise, she said, I couldn't believe it. After the opening of these parad paradisical laws, there was war in heaven. She said, I felt that the enemy could not ever be in that realm of paradise. What business has he got to be there harassing me? But here he was harassing me. And I, I just, I thought when I would come to that realm of spirit, he could not be ever permitted to be there. But he began to uh, speak into my mind and uh, give objections to those things that the Holy Spirit had given to me. And these were some of his objections. He said, oh, these laws, they're intolerable impositions. Oh, you can't possibly keep those. No one could ever reach these requirements. And who did I think I was that I could? And then he'd say, oh, you're turning grace into works again. If you're going to work your way through here and throw out grace. And then he said, told me that Jesus had satisfied the law so that I might be free from it. A lot of people feel that. They don't need to keep the law because Jesus satisfied it. Well, when we keep it, it's not for brownie points or anything like that. We keep it because it's his nature. Because he's written it there. I don't want to covet or steal or commit adultery or any of those things. Is there any reason why I'd want to put that aside? That's his nature. And the Lord has written it there. And so he said to her, you're putting aside your liberty. What liberty do I want? Do I want to have liberty to do something uh, opposed to the nature of God? Is that liberty? To do my own thing? I have enough of that. I do not want liberty to do my own thing. I have liberty to do what pleases my Father. And that's the only place where I find delight and satisfaction. And so I think it's very important to understand the arguments that the enemy gave Jane Reed in paradise. Because I want you to know and write this in your book, put it in your computer, it's going to happen to you if you continue on in the Lord. In this realm of spirit in which we are coming, we are going to have lots of opposition, perhaps not even so much out there, it'll be in our own mind. From the carnal mind that will say, huh, who do you think you are? Father, my father. We just magnify your name, Lord Jesus. And Lord, these things that I want to share are so new to me that I hardly have utterance for them. And my knees do fear and quake that I won't have 
But Father, they're your word. They're your uh, way. They're your spirit. So I'm trusting you to give me utterance. And I'm trusting you to give your children hearing ears to hear what it is that even these mortal words can hardly convey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, my Father, that you'll open the spiritual understanding of your people. Their spiritual ears shall be wide open, and you'll give them understanding in their hearts, even if their head doesn't know a thing of what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, I've been uh, practicing on this people here for two or three nights. And I believe um, Darla has generously taken extra time to make tapes of the uh, message on Thursday night, which was on the Sabbath rest. And then uh, Friday night, I began to, uh, to share on the laws of paradise by Jane Lead. Uh, Jane Lead is the saint who was living in the late uh, 16, um, 1600s. And the Lord caught her up into the realm of paradise, as he did with Paul. And he taught her uh, the Ten Commandments, what were the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament that now are laws of paradise, but he showed her the spiritual meanings of them. And it's, it's not any longer any do's and don'ts, thou shalt not, or anything like this. It's showing us the heart of our Father. And we need to know the heart of our Father in order to walk in this realm of paradise, in this realm of spirit that we're coming into in the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this is some of those, um, you know, the Lord speaks of taking out of his treasures things both new and old. And these are some of the old that he's taken out of his treasures. I have been reading them for several years and enjoying them uh, very much. And the Lord recently spoke to my heart, I want all of my children to know these things and to understand them. He said, I want you to begin to teach them and break that bread very small. Uh, not that you have to memorize all this. He said, I want their heart attitude to agree with the spirit of the laws of paradise. So are you with me? Can we go there? Not sure where we're going, but I hope we can go there. <laughs> um, I won't repeat myself. I could review the first three commandments that we took the other night, but then I wouldn't have time to finish possibly. But as I said, Darla has made some tapes and put them back there. So we're going to begin at the fourth commandment. Um, is nobody going to tape this morning? It is. Oh, this is, this is really smart. Don't even have to have the chief uh, engineer over there. Because I wanted to read on to the tape so that you would have it. The place where you might get this book, The Laws of Paradise by Jane Lead, is obtainable from um, Larry and Betty Hodges, P.O. Box 728, Linwood, North Carolina. Zip code is 27299. And that's just on a love offering basis. If you have it, fine. If you don't, that's still okay. And so he has um, been led of the Lord to put into print and even on tape on the internet, uh, almost all of her messages, all that he has been able to obtain. And I believe it's God's time. She is a confirmer from that day. She saw the things that are to be for us. She, the things that she received from the Lord, she said, there are no people uh, in this generation that, um, that qualify for any of these things. But the Lord is revealing them for those upon whom the ends of the age have come, for that virgin church that he's raising up in this day. Hallelujah. Those that are not defiled with man, this man particularly. Hallelujah. And so we're going to start into the fourth commandment, which is in the um, old Mosaic covenant, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And uh, her remark upon this that the Lord showed her is only those who are dead can cease from labor. Remember on the Sabbath day you are to cease from your own works? Only those who are dead can cease from labor. Isn't that true? As long as you're alive, you're doing your thing. 
you're working. And, and I know with older people who go to a, a convalescent home or something, the biggest cry of their heart is, I feel so useless because I can't work anymore. This is a very, um, uh, to us, it's a, a measure of our acceptability, of our worth, if we can work and be productive. But when it comes to the things of the Spirit, the Lord is trying to get that out of us, <laughs> to let Him work and to let Him order what He wants done. So in keeping the Sabbath day, the Lord says, in the Spirit, only those who are dead to self can cease from their labors and enter into His rest. Thus, this commandment reaches only the children of the resurrection. Hallelujah. And we trust that though we are they, the children of the resurrection. So there must be a rest in paradise. In that realm of spirit to which we come, we must rest. We cannot bring all the turmoil of this sixth day uh, man that we have been. All that savors of the six days labor is to be ceased from. The true inward Sabbath is to cease from all sinful workings either in mind or in body, not doing our own pleasure, not speaking our own words. It's not keeping a special day. You have some contend, well, um, if you keep the right Sabbath day, you've got it. Um, I've had uh, pastors uh, write to me and <laughs> try to correct me, send me tapes and say, well, sister, don't you know, if you obey the commandment to keep the right day, the seventh day, like a Saturday Sabbath, well, then you're uh, being obedient to the Lord, and he's pleased with that. And I say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get into contention over this, but the Lord is revealing the reality of the Sabbath day. And if you will look in Colossians, I think it's chapter 3, it speaks of, oh, I don't want you to look there now, I'm just saying this in passing. It speaks uh, that the Sabbath day is a shadow of things to come. It's a shadow of something. Well, I don't want to walk in shadows, do you? We have walked in them long enough. I want to know the reality. And the reality of the Sabbath day is ceasing from doing your own thing. Ceasing from the work of the soul and letting the spirit rule. Hallelujah. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Is that good? All right. So it's not keeping a special day. Because when we are in spirit... We are in the Lord's day, and we are keeping his true Sabbath. So that should be true every day of our life, once we understand this, that every day is to you a Sabbath day. We're resting from our own works, and we're, we're saying, Father, what is your pleasure? Hallelujah. Um, now you can turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. As I was pondering these things, the Lord brought this uh, to my heart. I had never understood or seen this in this way. I'll just kind of tell you the story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the story of this portion here is... Um, Judah had violated the Sabbaths of the Lord. They hadn't given the land a rest. They hadn't um, uh, set at liberty the people who were, um, you know, they were allowed to, if a Hebrew person owed them money, was not able to pay, they were allowed to make of them men servants or maid servants only for so long. They were to set them free on the seventh year. And if they didn't do so, they were violating the Sabbath. So there were many types of Sabbath, the Sabbath year, the Sabbath day, the Sabbath in regard to uh, uh, liberty to their slaves. And so they had a uh, Sabbath to rest the land every uh, seventh year. And they had just thrown all of these out and they were just doing their own thing. And so on top of that, they had all this um, idolatry that they had uh, entered into because of the nations round about, they had committed spiritual adultery from the Lord. And so in Jeremiah 17, Babylon is at the gate. 
all the armies of Nebuchadnezzar were standing at the gate, ready to come in and take Jerusalem. So they were, they're pretty scared. And they didn't quite know what to do. Well, Lord, are, are you going to deliver us or, or are you not going to? And so the Lord is, is saying to them in verse um, 17 here. No, verse 21, pardon me. Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. So he's telling them, they're worried about Babylon. They're, they're going to come and, and invade us and perhaps burn our cities and ravage our women and children. And he's, the Lord isn't talking to them about that at all. He's talking to them about how they have violated the Sabbath. And first of all, he said, You've, um, you should take heed to yourselves to bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. But what the Lord wants us to see there is, what is he saying to us? What is he saying in the spirit, bear no burden on the Sabbath day? If you're in the rest of the Lord, are you to be anxious and um, um, worried and concerned and, and, and shaking in your boots uh, maybe about Y2K or whatever? Is that your portion? He said, bear no burden on the Sabbath day. In other words, trust me. Put your trust in me. Don't bear any burden on the Sabbath day. Take the burdens of that carnal man off, and you walk in the Spirit, and I will look after you. I don't have any burden for Y2K. I'll tell you why I don't. For many, many years I have known that we are going to come to a time at the passing away of one dispensation and another one coming in. And I see the pattern in the Old Testament when the law passed away and grace uh, came in through the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time of turmoil. Remember when the, the temple was destroyed and everything? It says that the sky was dark with crosses. The people were being uh, crucified at that time and the temple was destroyed. Well, that was... Uh, a tremendous upheaval in the life of the Jewish people. But this was a necessary evil in the changing of dispensations. And so I see today that there's going to be some necessary evils in order for this one order to, ch to fall and another one to come in. Because people don't change easily or quickly or overnight. So the Lord usually shakes their heavens and their earth to bring in something new. So I have purpose in my heart. I'm not going to fear because he's already shaken my earth and blasted it out of the water and shaken my heaven. So I know it's for good and not for evil. So whatever he has to do out there, I say, Lord, go for it. Do it. The sooner the better and, and, and help us to get on into the kingdom into the new age. So I don't entertain any fear. I don't carry any burden on the Sabbath day. No, I don't. And I hope you don't either. Hallelujah. Because I know it must come. But we are not of those that shall bear the judgment. We are of those who are raised up to be saviors in that day. We are the deliverers. What are we doing with our knees knocking? I don't know why I said all this, but it must be for somebody. Okay. I shall carry on. <laughs> And so, in um, verse uh, 22, Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath, as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear, nor receive instruction. Can you understand why the Babylonians are at the gate? Hard, stiff-necked. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein. Then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes, sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever." He's saying, if you will obey me, I will honor you. I will raise you up. I will exalt you. But if not, there's the Babylonians. 
Now, verse 27, But if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle the fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Now, over in um, uh, chapter 34, there's another portion of the Sabbath that they were not obeying. Chapter 34 and verse 6. Um, I don't seem to have the right verse, but that's okay. The, um, Babylon is at the door. Verse 16, pardon me, I didn't write it down correctly. said, <clears throat> I'll read 15. Ye were now turned. No, I have to go back and tell you some things that happened here. This is the part I tell the story. I don't always read it all. Um, when the Lord said, now, if you'll keep my Sabbath and set free your manservants and your maidservants that are of Hebrews. They were allowed, I understand, to have uh, servants in bondage from other nations, but not their own people. They could only let them serve them until their debt was paid for, if they had a debt. If it was two years, they'd have to let them go after two years. And if it was not, they surely had to let them go in the seventh year, in the Sabbath year. Even if their debt was not fully paid, they had to let them go. And so... Verse 17, 14 tells how they do this. At the end of seven years, let every ye go, every man his brother, an Hebrew, which hath been sold unto thee. And when he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But your fathers hearken not unto me, neither inclined their ear. And verse 16, by doing that, you know what they did to God? But ye turned and polluted my name. And to pollute the Lord's name is to make his nature seem unjust, cruel, unkind. And it caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom he had set at liberty at their pleasure, to return, and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and for handmaids. So I'll just give you the scenario here. Here's old Nebuchadnezzar at the door of the city, at the gate of the city, ready to come in and take them. And they're all huddled together with the high priest and, and with the elders and the princes of the people. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Is God going to save us or is he not going to save us? And Oh, pray really hard. And God is saying through Jeremiah, you have polluted my Sabbath. And he lists the different kind of Sabbath in which they have not been obedient and have not kept his word. And then he says, if you'll just do this one thing, if you will at least show uh, a repentant heart and let your, your bond servants, your men servants and your maid servants that are of your brethren, if you'll let them free, then I'll, I'll put my hand on those, ne those Babylonians and I'll send them away. I won't let them come in. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, of course, we'll do it. They ran home and, and they set free all the manservants and maidservants. And, oh, boy, that's wonderful that the Lord would, you know, just give us such a small thing to do. And he's going to set us free from the Babylonians. So the Babylonians didn't go anywhere. They just camped. They didn't come in. God told them, don't leave now. I've got to test my people. So after about a week of serving themselves and making their own bread and drawing their own bath water. They thought, eh, we don't like this. We sure miss those servants. So they called their servants back. Get back here. You're, you're not really supposed to be free. That was just a mistaken judgment. And Get back here and serve us. I need my water and I need my food cooked and so on. So they brought their men servants and maid servants back into servitude. Guess what? The Lord said to the Babylonians, have at her. They will not obey me. They will not keep my rest, go into it, and take that people into captivity. He said, I have delivered you unto the sword. That's what he said. Now, it seems to me when God would go to this extent that the sa keeping the Sabbath is very important to him. Wouldn't you think so? Now, if we will take this and put it down into the spirit where we live today. I didn't understand this at all, but the Lord was dealing with my heart as we were driving along the road one day, just putting these things into place in my spirit, and he said, What is Babylon? 
Babylon is confusion, right? And if we are in a place of stiff neckedness to the Lord, we want to do our own thing. We don't want to come into his rest and let him do his pleasure to us do what the mind of the Spirit would show us. We want to do our thing. Guess what? Babylon comes in to the mind. And we walk in confusion. Hear it. Is that not true? You go your own way and do your own thing, the Lord says to Babylon. Take over. He doesn't have to say that. It just happens. <laughs> Takes over your mind. You are in confusion, doubt, and fear. But if you will remain in his rest and do those things and set at liberty them that are by and keep his rest, then the hand of the Lord is upon Babylon <laughs> and he cannot come and give you confusion. You walk in that perfect peace in your mind, confidence Amen. and trust in him. Amen. Is that good? Amen. I never saw that. I never even thought of that relating to our Sabbath. But that's exactly how it works. If you let him have his way and yield up your way to him, then you have peace in your mind. Otherwise, Babylon is ruling. It's taken over and you feel the fire of it because with confusion, there's always torment and, and um, distress. Is there not? Yeah. Hallelujah. And so... The rest reaches yet farther than this. These outward workings that we do are a type and shadow of the, the son and the daughter, the manservants and the cattle within your gates, within the gates of the external man that are forbidden to work. Uh, not only your spirit and your mind should rest from labor and commerce, but your outward should cease its trafficking as a wheel that is never at rest. Now I'm going to take this down and break it, break this bread small. Um, I have noticed in my own life, in the lives of others, that the last few years or so, I'm hearing from the body of Christ, particularly from the sisters. They're saying, you know, we don't enjoy doing our, our mall thing anymore. We used to go to the mall, <clears throat> be some mall rats or whatever they want to call them. We just loved going to the mall and buying things and even just looking. We can't do that anymore. Um, when we go there, we just don't feel that anointing. And I'll tell you, when I go to a mall, I'm only there about five minutes, I begin to lose strength. I'm so, in about 15 minutes, I'm so tired. I'm more tired than if I had worked hard all day in my office. I think, Lord, this is strange. What is going on? But if I need to go there for something specific, I head straight to the place where I need to get it. I get it and go away. I don't lose strength. I just do what I have to do. But I don't let my eyes be drawn by the merchandise. I don't let my ears be attracted to the things that are going on. And this is what is happening. The Lord is... Um, taking us from that thing of trafficking, of buying and selling and merchandising and all that. He is delivering us from this because this is such a snare. A person spends so, so long a time, so much time spent in that, probably more time than with the Lord. And um, I'll have to tell one on my husband. I love him dearly, but he loves to uh, read the classifieds. He'll get a paper every day, hastily goes over the news as if that's quite of second importance, reads the classifieds and reads and reads and reads. Well, I don't know how many things there are there that we don't need, but he reads them and reads them and uh, just, oh, cutting out, clipping this out and that out and that out. And uh, I think, my, you know, that's taking a lot of time. But the Lord has been dealing with him recently and he bought the paper and he's doing the same thing and he came to me afterwards. He said, you know, Elaine, today I started reading the classifieds. I was reading it for about five minutes. I started to feel sick. Can you believe it? I said, yeah, I can. <laughs> he had been praying and asking the Lord to bring him into the rest. I said, expect some things to happen. And so they started happening with the newspapers. <laughs> And so that's just a homely example. I didn't think he'd mind me telling you that. And so in each individual life, 
it's going to be different. But expect that he's going to, if you ask him to bring you into the rest, expect he's going to bring some changes into your life. He's going to deal with those things that are trafficking in our outer man, the things that our, our eyes are looking at and our ears are hearing of the outer man that are really not anything that the Lord has for us. They're just something the soul likes to do. It's kind of satisfied by that. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Is he dealing with some of you like this? Just uh, yield to that. It's good. It's the Lord. It's part of coming into his rest. And so we have fulfilled the time of the six days of work. And we have now opportunity to enter into this holy Sabbath. And we want to do that. And in this holy Sabbath, no work is required of you but to believe and to rest upon his omnipotency to bring all to you. There's no need to wander out from your tabernacle, the tabernacle which the Lord has pitched to gather food, because it's going to be rained down upon your tent if you continue in this holy rest of believing. Before we left home, we had purchased something for our computer. Like we have a, a tape duplicator now. And sometimes the situations in which we make our tapes are in home meetings and so on. And um, the tapes are not always the best. There's interruptions, coughing, um, phone calls, what have you. And so we need to clean up our tapes to make them better. So we bought something to put in the computer that will do that. But I don't have any expertise in knowing how to put this together. So I bought it in faith that the Lord would send somebody who knew. I think I only had that um, device in my house sitting on my desk for about two days. And he, in his sovereignty, uh, caused us to meet a family. The young man is, um, has a little computer business. I mentioned this to him. Oh, he said, I know all about that. When you get back, Elaine, give me a call. I'll come over and see you and set you up. And he is a Christian who's out of the system and hungry as all get out. I thought, oh, my father, uh, there was no need for me to wander out of my rest to look for the provision that I had need of. I bought it in faith knowing I didn't know what to do with it. And my husband didn't either. I bought it in faith that the Lord um, would make provision for it. And so I find instead of striving at what you have need of, you just, um, just walk in whatever he says. And even if it's kind of impossible for you, just say, well, Father, if this is what you're doing, I'll just take this step in faith and I know you'll make provision for the next and the next. And he does. And this is um, a greater walking in faith than we experienced in um, the realm of Pentecost. Because we would do things there by faith, but in the realm of tabernacles, we do by faith that which the Lord says. So then it's not so much faith as obedience to, to the word that we have heard, which necessitates the fact that we must first hear his voice, then obey it, and wait for him to do the next step. And so in the rest, we don't have to try to make our own provision. It's going to be rained down upon our tent. We continue in this holy rest of believing. And how was it for the Lord? When he needed an upper room, it was there. When he needed an ass to ride into Jerusalem, the Lord, uh, he was shown where it would be. And did he have to um, put on an evangelistic campaign to raise money to pay his taxes? No. <laughs> the Lord showed him, just go fishing here. Just tell Peter to go fishing. And there's a certain fish that has got money for your taxes. And so this is a realm in which we have never walked. But it is a realm that the Lord is opening up for us. That we will just know by the Spirit his provision and what he has for us. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. This is exciting. Amen. And I'm experiencing in... Um, our ministry, that the more we give to God's people, the more he showers again upon us. Last year, I would say, um, I had an, um, some teaching from the Lord. He said, I'm teaching you kingdom economics. Uh, somebody would send us a, a gift, and the Lord would say, that isn't for you, that's for so-and-so. 
and it was some little uh, Christian who was struggling and uh, wanting to uh, walking in these things but not having anybody who cared for their soul or their state the Lord said that's for so and so then the next check that would come the Lord would say that's for somebody else this went on for about three months fairly consistently finally I said Lord what are you doing I mean I don't mind doing this but why don't you just just send it to those people why are you sending it this way he said I'm teaching you kingdom economics the, oh, praise the Lord. That um, to know that um, if the Lord says it's for somebody else, then it's for somebody else. When I was down, I feel to tell you this also because it's part of the rest. I was uh, ministering in North Carolina a year ago on, uh, the pre on the Melchizedek priesthood order. And I had asked Brother John Gibson, I said, please, Brother, don't mention money. I said, you did last year. And I was so embarrassed I could have hid under the bench. I just felt awful. Oh, but his sister, he said, people want to help you. They want to help with your fare, and they know it's you know, quite expensive to come down here. So, you know, they want me to give them that opportunity. I said, I'm sorry, brother. I just feel embarrassed about it. If they want to give to me, they may, but I don't want you even to suggest it. I just don't feel right. And as a Melchizedek priest, I receive tithes. I do not take them. Levi takes tithes. I don't take tithes. <laughs> and so, well, if you insist. So we had um, a three-day convention, and at the very last, and not a word was said about money. I didn't even let them put a basket with the tapes or anything. And at the end, after I finished speaking of Melchizedek, I stepped down, and the men started coming to me one after another. They'd put their hand out and take my hand and put some money in my hand. Then they'd put their arms over me and cry over me. Every man that came did this. And this, a few sisters came. I expected them to cry because we were, we're always crying. But the men, I didn't expect this at all. <laughs> it just blew me away. They just came and, and gave to me and cried over me. I thought, oh, Father, this was so worth it. And I had told this brother, John Gibson, he said, well, let me know if your fare is met. I said, I'll never tell. But when I, afterwards, I came to him, I said, I have to tell. I said, it's uh, far more than met. I said, it's more than I would ever dream possible that these people have put into my hand. And it was so very precious. So we're coming into such a wonderful new way. Oh, my father, I love you. I thank you for this privilege, Lord Jesus, of ministering to your children, to your beloveds, Lord, to those who are your bride, to those who long to be one with you. Oh, Father, how we worship you, how we honor you and adore you. Lord Jesus, we would desire to serve you more acceptably. And I just ask, Father, that you'll open the heart of every person within the sound of my voice, that you'll cause them to hear that portion that is for them, and that you'll not let anyone go away empty, that you'll give every man and woman his portion, be, be, be they younger or older, Father, that you'll give them that portion that they can walk in at this time, Father, that you'll anoint my words, Father, feeble though they may be, that you'd cause them to be a reality and life and wisdom to those that hear them. I thank you for the privilege of ministering to this people, Lord, the heirs of salvation, the um, holders of the truths of the kingdom of God, the nucleus of those upon whom the ends of the age are come. I can't think of a higher honor, Lord Jesus, or a greater privilege than that which you bestowed upon me even in this hour to minister your precious precious grain to the hungry. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. I would like to invite those at the back you who, to fill these six or seven chairs there. Because when I look down there, there won't be any amen corner. And besides which, I'm nearsighted and I love to see your faces, if you wouldn't mind. There's six or seven chairs there. And I want to see your faces. Because I'm not saying a word till they're filled. 
that's mean, isn't it? I take advantage of the situation. They're all cozy and comfortable. <coughs> Those chairs are specially anointed, I want you to know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Oh, my Father, hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you for humoring me. <laughs> I appreciate that. Glory to God. I want you to know I love each and every one of you here. I don't um, know where you all live or that much about you all, but I can tell you one thing. You're very beloved of your Father. And he whom my Father loves, I can't help but love. I just can't help it because I see him in you. You bear his likeness. Hallelujah. And so tonight, I'm getting into something new that I haven't ministered on before, and so I'm going to practice on you. Is that all right if I practice on you? Dress rehearsal? Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm going to get into some of the teachings of uh, Jane Leeds, but I first want to share a few personal things that the Lord spoke to me about. Jane Lead, and for those who didn't hear about her, she was um, a prophetess who lived in England in um, the late 1700s, or well, the late 1600s actually. We have writings from her written about 1670, 1680, and so on. And she had uh, tremendous truths for our day. And she said, I know they're not. She said, there aren't any that I know in this day that um, is, are, is walking in these things, but they are, they are for those upon whom the ends of the age are come. The Lord is going to raise up a people that will walk in these things. So I've been reading those books and enjoying them and wondering um, if I could ever share them with anybody. And July the 9th, just uh, a month or two ago, um, for days, I'd been having this thought on my heart that I was to share from the book of um, the Laws of Paradise, where the Lord took the Ten Commandments and showed her the spiritual realities of them and said, these are what you need to know to walk in paradise. In that new realm of the spirit, you need to know these spiritual laws. And I've been very taken with that book in particular. So for three or four days, this was rolling in my heart such a longing and a yearning desire to share these and to teach them. But I thought, well, that's just me. So one day when I was in prayer, the Lord said, these thoughts that I have put upon your heart concerning the teaching of my laws of paradise are from me. They have come forth from my heart. And I would have my people to understand them in such a simple way that they cannot fail to enter into them. It is time for them to know them and to have heart agreement with them and also to know the nature of the warfare that will come against them when they begin to live in the new laws of my new realm. And I've tasted some of this warfare of walking in a realm of spirit that people out here do not understand and I was getting a bit bent out of shape over it. And the Lord just comforted my heart. He said, this is the battle of Armageddon, Elaine, that you're experiencing. This warfare against your mind, against this walk of the realm of spirit that you're in. And so because some of us are beginning to rise up into that realm of spirit that we have not walked before, we need to know what um, the blessings and the dangers are that we will encounter in that place. Have I got your interest? Do you want to stay? Can I practice on you some more? Yeah. All right, we'll do it. <laughs> now, before I go into that, I just feel impressed to uh, share a few things um, about the rest of the Lord. As I said last night, I spoke on the Sabbath rest. I said you can't enter in at all 
to this realm of the spirit, this realm of paradise, a realm of tabernacles, whatever you want to call it. You can't enter into that unless you come into his rest, ceasing from your own works, from your own ways, and so on. And so I just wanted to share a few things from the body of Christ that they have shared with me about the rest. I would have done so last night, but it was getting a little too long, and I thought I had said sufficient. Anyway, some are comical, and some are, are just precious but it will perhaps speak to your heart. Um, there's a sister from Montana, and she was asking the Lord for something specific uh, in regard to taking a trip or not to take a trip. And, you know, she really, really wanted to take this trip, but she also wanted to only to do so if the Lord was in it. So there is a conflict between her soul and the spirit. So she said, Father, please tell me something very specific that there won't be a shadow of a doubt in my heart. So she woke up in the morning with this secular song ringing loud and clear within her. Now, I don't know this song, but I'll sing that line that the Lord gave her. I'll just make up my own tune. Is that all right? <laughs> and it was this line. Do nothing till you hear from me. <laughs> Do nothing till you hear from me. Oh, she said, all right gotcha <laughs> and so she she didn't go because he didn't say anything to go and she was just as happy her soul settled down and she was quite satisfied to stay home because she knew she was in the will of the Lord so I could say that that is um, basically the rest of the Lord do nothing till you hear from me is that all right could it get any simpler than that yeah so in order to do that, you have to hear from him. Now this is where the catch comes, because some say, Oh, it's all right for you to say, but God doesn't talk to me very much. I remember when um, Paul was courting Ma, that's my husband, way back when, he was complaining to me bitterly one day that God never talked to him. I said, Bill Cook. I said, I see him talking to you all the time, but you just don't listen. You think it's your own mind or your imagination or something. You just don't take hold of it and say, oh, and respond to it uh, as that God has spoken to you. You just think it's your imagination or, well, maybe a few times it is, but I see him talking to you many times and you don't take a hold of that fact. And I think, I think God is talking to us all the time, but we are not all the time listening. We're not all the time acknowledging it. And so I just want to toss a few things out along that line. Um, I have a few things from the body here. Um, there was a brother, a very new Christian, and the Lord is bringing him very fast. He lives in our district. And he had two dreams, one after another, where the Lord was dealing with him about um, walking in the spirit and uh, coming into the rest. In this first dream, he saw there was a wishing well there and there were coins in the bottom of the wishing well and they were as clear as could be. And so his children were standing there and he said, you can have those coins. Just step in there and pick them out and you can have them, they're yours. So they stepped in there and they took a few steps with their feet, muddied the water. They couldn't see a coin anywhere. And then, the next night, he had another dream, very similar. He was in a boat, and um, it was a glass line, a boat, glass on the bottom, and he could see the bottom of the uh, lake when the waters were calm. But when the waves were roaring, he couldn't see the bottom at all. And so the Lord is giving us a picture here of when we are walking in, the troubled sea of self, um, or we're walking in our own ways and we get our feet in there, trying to do our thing, we can't see our way. We can't see the treasures in the, uh, in the, the wishing well. We can't see the bottom of the water. It's all blurry and confused if you get your big feet in there, or get your own carnal understanding in there, your troubled sea. And so the Lord is saying, I want to teach you how to come into the C 
sea of glass. I never heard of that term until I read Jane Lee's books, but it is in the book of Revelation. They stand on the sea of glass. We didn't know what that meant. But all oh, the sea of glass people are those who are in his rest. Doesn't matter what's happening around about them. They are within at peace and at rest and at trust in the Lord. We are that sea of glass people. And so you can take your pick. You get up in the daytime, in the morning, and you can have a troubled sea all day if you want to. Or you can walk in the sea of glass all day. And it doesn't matter if somebody screams at you or, or um, you're in a traffic jam or whatever. You can choose which sea you're going to walk in. If you feel the waves and the billows start to roll, you think, uh-oh, I've got to get a hold of this because it's up to you. And you speak to your soul. You know that David used to do that? He said, Why art thou disquieted within me, O my soul? And um, why are you disturbed and distressed? He said, Hope thou in God, who is the light of my countenance and my God. And so when your, your sea starts to, to get a little bouncy and, and rough, speak to your soul. It's all right. I'm in the Lord's hands. He's watching over me. I have nothing to fear. And um, whatever is happening out there, I don't need to be a part of that. I can stay in the spirit. And so you can choose each day. And I know one brother told me something, and I thought, wow, this is wisdom. He said, Elaine, we give other, another person the authority or the power to lift us up or put us down, just like a yo-yo. We give them that power. So you give someone power to wreck your day. If you're going to let their remarks or, or um, kind of a whatever kind of look on their face that isn't too pleasing, if you take that personally and get all bent out of shape over it, you give them power to put you down or lift you up. I thought, my, that's a good word. So I have been working on that one because I'm a sensitive person. Most women are sensitive to how other people feel about them, but we can't operate on our emotions. We have to go by the Spirit of the Lord and know that um, many times if uh, people are fighting against us or rejecting us in any perceivable way, it's not really us. It's the Lord. It's the Lord that they can't stand. and They don't know what it is, so they're kind of mad at us. <laughs> but then when they get turned around, they love what is in us or who is in us. But there is a temporary uh, striving against the spirit within. Hallelujah. But I thought you might like to hear that. And one more. Shelly Smith from Arkansas. Her mom phoned me just the day before I left to come down here. She said, Shelly wants to tell you something, Elaine. But uh, Shelly is deaf, so her mother talks for her. Shelly's here and her mom's here and her mother is speaking to me very slowly and concisely so that Shelly can lip read her lips and then she tells Shelly what I say and Shelly lip reads what Elaine said. So Shelly wanted to tell me that she'd come into his rest, that she'd entered into the land and so her mom told me how this happened. Shelly had been a victim of uh, elephant man's disease and um, she had some deformity in her face, but the Lord healed her of that. But she is still deaf. That's the only thing she still has. She said, her mom told me that um, the Lord spoke to her to cast herself on God. And she said, you know, when you fall, you fall on God. So she said, I tried it. She said, I threw myself at him. And then when I did, I said, Lord, I've landed on your feathers. Oh, it was so wonderful. I've landed on your feathers. <laughs> and then he said to her, you have entered the land. You have come into my rest. Isn't that precious? Just by falling upon him, not leaning any longer onto her own understanding or her own ways or her own mind, but just falling upon the Lord. And this is what he wants us to do in coming into his rest, falling upon the Lord all the time and hearing his voice. And I want to just share a, a little bit on hearing his voice, particularly for the, um, the younger people. Um, 
the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart one day and he said, uh, it is very important for my people to learn the rise and the fall of the Spirit. He said, when I walked in my, um, in my, um, what do you call it? my mortal body, when he walked in his body on this earth, he said, I walked always in the rise and the fall of the Spirit of God within me. He didn't always have words from his father, although I'm sure he did have some words, but he said, I always walked in the rise and the fall of the Spirit. So I will just go into this a little bit. When uh, the high priest had on his robes, in the robe there was this beautiful breastplate of righteousness with all the beautiful stones on there, and in behind that was a pocket. And in that pocket were these stones called the Urim and Thummim, or in English, lights and perfections. And when the high priest wanted to inquire something at the mouth of the Lord, he would take out these stones and hold them before the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, Philistines are at the gate, shall we go up and fight them or not? And if the answer was no, the stones would stay dull. And if the answer was yes, the stones would light up. And that was how he heard the word of the Lord. Now we have within us not stone stones. We have the rock. The rock Christ Jesus. And when he's in something, his spirit lights up. And when he's not in it, he doesn't say no. He just, um, you either feel a sinking feeling, like I call it blah, or just there's no response at all. Just level. There's no lights on or any anything like that would say go ahead. So I have learned to go by the rise and the fall of the Spirit a great deal. In fact, I have practiced them. This, some people might think I'm fanatical if they knew the ways I have practiced hearing from the Lord. <laughs> I've told you about going to the store and praying over the different puddings, which one is the most healthy, has the least additives, and so on. And I would just go, I would put my finger on this one, and I would ask the Lord, and I would feel for any rise or fall of the Spirit. When I came to the one, the, the Spirit rose, okay. And what you should see me when I'm baking or when I'm canning. I was canning with a friend from Alberta recently. She said, Elaine, I use honey. I, she said, how much honey do you use? I said, I go by the rise and fall of the Spirit. <laughs> I just put so much until the Spirit goes like that. <laughs> goes down to it goes down just a bit. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> yes, I do. I try to take everything uh, to my father, and I, I, um, I don't just say, "No, I'm praying about this." I just, um, this is how the Lord has taught me, just to, to take everything to Him, just present it to Him. Oh, father, what about this? Or uh, is this good? Or what do you think about that? Or, I, I do this all the time. Uh, I do it in such a, it's such a part of the fiber and fabric of my being that it's, um, it's just as natural to me now as breathing. And if people ask me, well, are you going to do this or that or something else? Um, well, I have no idea. I mean, if I haven't heard it from my father, I don't know. And I want you to know through all this training, there is only one thing that I fear. The Lord has worked in me a godly fear of the Lord. I fear to do my own thing. To go my own way, to make any decision on my own. He's worked that fear in me. I've become so used to uh, seeking his face and his guidance that I have learned that's the only safe place to be in. I feel so safe and secure when I know that I'm in the will of the Lord. You, you would probably think this is egocentric, but when I'm in an airplane and I'm flying somewhere like to Minneapolis or so on, I think to myself, well, this is a safe place. Everybody's going to get there safely because I'm here. I'm here in the will of the Lord. <laughs> I'm not saying that, well, look who I am. I'm simply because God has put me here. You're all going to be safe because I'm here. <laughs> I remember reading about uh, Sister Jean Guion, 
um, that um, saint uh, in France and uh, how she walked so closely to the Lord. She said one time she was in a, a small boat out on the waters and uh, a number, perhaps a dozen people were with her and, and somehow the boat capsized and, and they were all falling out of the boat and she said, praise the Lord, I'm going to be with you. She was so happy. She thought, figure she's going under the water and she's going to be with Jesus. And the Lord rebuked her soundly. He said, that is very selfish. She said, don't you have any concern for those who don't know me? Oh, I'm sorry. And she began to intercede that, that they would all be safe. And they were all safe. But uh, that's just just how it was. <laughs> I, that just did something for my heart, you know. That we have, even though the boat capsized, there wasn't any fear whatsoever. Oh, I'm going to get to go home. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And so I think <coughs> Hallelujah. I think I maybe told you oh no, one more. I had a little letter from a, a sister in North Carolina. She said, Elaine, my husband has been a pastor here for thirty eight years. We didn't know there was such a thing as the rest of the Lord. We didn't know that till we got your books and tapes. And she said, I was listening to your tape one time. I'm in the kitchen making supper. And she said, I was so thrilled when I heard about the rest of the Lord. I almost flew out of the kitchen. I think she meant raptured or something. <laughs> and uh, even though her husband had been a pastor all those years, yet he is open. He's open to the Lord. And they're open to entering into these new ways. I was so thrilled to hear that. So that's just a little feedback from, from his body. I thought you'd be interested in that. Because God is saying it all over the place. One more the Lord reminds me of. Um, we were at a meeting. I think Darla was there when they still lived uh, over in Washington. And um, I was speaking at a house meeting one night on the rest of the Lord. And after I finished this... Um, Housewife got up. She said, Oh, Elaine, I just have to share something. I said, Please do. And she said, I had a dream about a month ago. And in the dream, the Lord is giving me a report card. And there's this and that and something else. Everything checked off. I've been doing really well. It came to keeping the Sabbath X. And she thought, Oh, my word. I've really blown it. I don't know how to keep the Sabbath. And so she said, I knew the Lord was trying to tell me something, but I didn't know what. I didn't know how to keep the Sabbath. So the only thing that I knew was to do what they did in the Old Testament. So on Saturday, I worked really hard and got the meals ready for Sunday so I wouldn't have to work on Sunday. And she said, I did that for about a month. And I thought, this is not it. This is just too hard. Forget it, Lord. If that's, if that's it, I can't do it. And so she came to this meeting. She said, oh, I'm so glad to hear what it is. <laughs> yeah. So you see, I just want to tell you these little things to whet your appetite. Because this is a now word. It's for you. And if you haven't been entering into it before now, start tonight. Don't even wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> I had some people from, uh, some sisters from Calgary, Alberta, come out to my home recently we just sat around the kitchen table with uh, about four of them for three days, a uh, three-day weekend, and shared uh, these things of uh, the uh, feasts and uh, the rest of the Lord. And so on their way back, they usually stop at this city of Kelowna and visit one of their friends there and drink tea and share about the kids and life and so on. And my friend had got a vision of the rest. She said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to stop there just because I usually do, just drink tea and eat cookies and yak. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just only going to go there, Lord, if you're in it. So she prayed. She said, Father, if there's some reason that I should go there, if, you have some, if you're in this, then I'd be happy to go. But you'll need to show me, or I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping just for Gap Fest like I used to. I'm going to enter into his rest. So when she prayed diligently, the Lord showed her a little... Um, I call it the seeing eye, that she saw something in the spirit. And she saw her friend, and in this little um, inter interaction that she saw in the spirit, she saw her asking her friend, uh, herself, asking her friend, how are you? 
And her friend said, I'm dying. Oh, she said, I think I'm supposed to go. So she went, and uh, they sat around the table. They didn't get to the tea and cookies, and she said, how are you anyway? Tell me the truth. She said, I'm dying. Exactly as the Lord had shown her. And she was going to a church, and she was not being fed. She was starving. She said, I am so hungry. I feel like I'm dying. So they ministered the spirit to her and encouraged her and prayed for her. And so that was the challenge that they had received, that they would go out and they're not going to just do their own thing anymore. Just if you want me to do it, Father. So I hope and pray, and this is the reason for my coming, that you also would be challenged to do that, to enter into his rest in every aspect of your life. Hallelujah. Will you do that? Will you try? You may not win them all. I didn't win them all at first. I'm not even going to claim that I now win them all. But I sure try all the time. Hallelujah. And having so said, now we shall start with Miss Jane Lee. Okay. First of all, I have to start with Elaine Cook. Because the 1st of August, when the Lord wants to... <clears throat> me to teach me something new he, he began to deal with my heart and um, last year it was resurrection and the Melchizedek priesthood and I hadn't had any fresh word for quite some time I don't ever ask for it I just if he wants to tell me he just drops it into my heart well I'm in the bathroom brushing my teeth minding my own business when I heard the Lord say you are now dealing with legalities and authorities. Gulp, almost swallowed my toothpaste. And I, it felt like such a heavy word, I didn't stay to rinse the toothpaste out. I just ran and got my book and my pen and said, Lord, yes. You are now dealing with legalities and authorities. Your enemy has authority over you only as long as you are partaking of his tree that realm of the sense life feeling things this is a new classroom that I have for you to enter my sons for the most part have put their enemy far in the background as one who has already been conquered yes he has been conquered by me but he has not been conquered by them he has simply been ignored. This is not overcoming. To ignore your enemy and to proclaim loudly that he has no more power over you. Those who speak thus know not the subtleties of the power of the enemy that they yet serve. I shall teach thee of these things for your possessing of the land involves greater warfare, not less. Yet with wisdom and understanding as you have not known in the past, as you beat the air in vain. That verse in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, Paul says, So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Shadow boxing, never getting any contact with anything. Know that I am bringing you into a new understanding of possessing the land that I would have you share with those who have ears to hear. Anybody here with ears to hear? I hope so. Oh, glory to God. And so, the Lord is saying to my heart, and if he says it to me, I'm not special, I'm not exclusive. He's saying it to each and every one of us. Our warfare is not over. If you had thought it was, guess again. When uh, We'll take the, the, go back to the blueprint and see if what I'm saying is really true. When the children of Israel were in Egypt, they didn't have any warfare in Egypt. They had a lot of harassment by the Egyptians, by the flesh. The flesh harassed them a lot, but uh, there was no warfare there. And so how was it when they were in the wilderness? They had a few small skirmishes. No big scale warfare, right? When did they begin to really fight? When they entered the land. So some act as if, 
or when they enter this high realm of spirit, no warfare. Oh, Satan has nothing on me. I've got news for you. The scripture said that's when we just begin to fight. But it's going to be quite a different warfare than anything we had ever expected or thought about. Because in these realms, we're not dealing with those um, gross sins of, um, of the flesh that we dealt with um, back in Egypt or in the wilderness. Oh no, it's uh, things of a higher order because we're coming into a higher place and the enemy is going to try to resist us in that place. So I'm going to tell you about the war in heaven. And this is right up to date. It's from Revelation 12, where it speaks of the man-child, of the son, of uh, the sons coming forth. And there was war in heaven. Where is our heaven? In heavenly places in Christ. That spiritual realm in which we walk, there is war. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What do you think the nature of our warfare has been? You've been accused and accused before God day and night. Not, you might not think, well, the enemy did it, but it's someone who is carnal. Who do you think you are? Ah, who do you think you are? And even the world is saying, oh, they hear voices. Uh-huh. They ought to be put away there. You know what? The whole, uh, the whole realm in which we walk that is so precious and so mighty from God is very suspect as far as they are concerned. We ought to be put away. We are suspect. Okay? So there is that battle of carnal minds against the spiritual mind and as we come into this more perfectly the battle is going to intensify that's where the warfare is going to be it's not going to be um, uh, philistines and all like that it's this uh, this um, battle of armageddon against our mind against that realm of spirit in which we're walking and we know that in this warfare our weapons are not going to be carnal but spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds, Ephesians 6 and 12. And then um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll look at that for just a minute. 2 Corinthians 10 and verses 4 and 5. For the war weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations. Oh, I thought here these strongholds would be like um, uh, Beelzebub or um, some of those really big bad guys. Oh, imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So here are the rulers of darkness we're making wa a warfare against imaginations high things that will exalt itself against God our thoughts carnal thoughts I maybe uh, mentioned to you last night this friend that came up <laughs> from the states and she said uh, the Lord had been dealing with her about something and she was uh, not in agreement with it she was kind of um, arguing about it and so on and the spirit said you have been taking carnal counsel Oh no, oh no, Lord, she said, uh, I didn't talk to anybody about this. Yeah, you've been taking counsel with your carnal reasoning mind against me. How do you like it? <laughs> and we do it all the time, don't we? And we have to stop ourselves, jerk ourselves up. Uh-oh, who's, um, who's talking to me here? With whom am I conferring? And maybe the Lord will say something and then we will um, 
pull it down into the realm of carnality and try to explain it by our carnal mind instead of saying, Father, I don't really understand this. Would you clarify this to me and let it stay in the spirit, not bring it down to a carnal level. So the battleground is in the heavens of our skull. Did you know that Golgotha means the skull? The hill of Golgotha was in the shape of a, hull, of, of a skull. And so that's where the battleground of Jesus was, on the hill of Golgotha. And this is going to be the battleground where his sons are going to labor, the heaven of our skull, our Golgotha, where we're going to lay down that carnal reasoning mind. Hallelujah. Is this okay? Is this good stuff? Whoa. So our enemy is the reasoning mind and it's vain imaginations. Oh, hallelujah. Um, as I was studying this, the Lord reminded me of something in Genesis chapter 6 and 5. And before I, we look at this, I want to just um, ask you off the top of the head, what were the sins that were so bad in Noah's time that God decided to... Um, cleanse the earth of all mankind except those eight people. What were the terrible sins that they did that were so bad? Think of, see if you can think of what they were. You will be surprised. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord didn't say it was this sin or that sin or the other sin. It was evil imaginations. Isn't that something? Oh, oh, oh. And I tell you, it's the same thing today. He's dealing with our evil imaginations. If you are maligning somebody in your mind or, or um, angry or, not, or unforgiving or whatever, uh, wrong attitude that you might have in your mind. You're having evil imaginations. And the Lord is against it. So we have our enemy here is the reasoning mind and it's vain imaginations. I'll just ask you this. Um, this may not happen to you now, but I'm sure somewhere along the line you've had this same battle. When you would go to pray, You'd be perfectly peaceful. You're going to have a good time with the Lord. And suddenly, in creeps all the thoughts of the day, all the things you weren't even thinking of. They're just kind of trotting through your mind, just chugging along here. Oh, my goodness. Get out. Get out. I want to pray. I want to just think about the Lord. The more you want to think about the Lord, the more these thoughts. What are they? They're vain imaginations <clears throat> that come to take the place of the Lord. And um, we have to cast down those vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and put it away and keep on, on rebuking it, putting it aside so that you can know the will of the Lord and can have communion with Him. It doesn't happen overnight, but if you start to pray and these things happen, stop and cast down every vain imagination, every high thing in you that's trying to replace the knowledge of God. Have you done that? If you haven't done that, just tend to it. Because then you can come to the place where your mind is at peace and at rest. And when you come to the Lord, there's nothing chugging through there. My mind is so peaceful most of the time. I just, um, I just have peace. I don't have a lot of questions or wonder what I'll do tomorrow. Somebody asked me tonight, what, do, you, do I think I'll be back here next year? I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow morning, let alone next year. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't even dare think about it. It's not none of my business. Right? right? Okay. <laughs> and so we have, as our enemy, King Reason, the carnal reasoning mind, and it's a darkened mind with vain imaginations. It imagines a vain thing. Hallelujah. I want to share something I learned early as a young Christian. I found, to my dismay, that there was something in me that whenever the Lord would say something to me, and it didn't even have to be anything spiritual. I'll just give you this holy example. Uh, on a Saturday, I had baked some fresh buns. And Sunday morning, we were going uh, to drive about 50 miles to visit a, a little church there. Someone wanted us to meet this pastor. Well, as we're getting ready to go, 
this thought came to me that I should take them some of my fresh buns. And immediately, another thought arose up with a carnal reasoning argument against that. Oh, no, you shouldn't do that. They'll think you're inviting yourself to lunch. Well, well, I couldn't have them thinking that, you know. I mean, that, that's hard on the ego. It's a big, couldn't, well, I won't take them, though. And you know what happened to those buns? They molded before we ever finished them. The first and last buns I ever had that molded, because I didn't do that. And also felt, the thought came, I should take a sweater. My carnal reasoning mind said, why would you want to do that? The sky is blue, there's not cloud anywhere. Oh yeah, why would I want to take a sweater? So I didn't take a sweater. So after we visited these folks, and we'd gone to their place for lunch, and they had been away all weekend, and they invited us for lunch, and they didn't have a speck of bread in the house. And in this small town, there's no, no stores open. They had to go to the Chinese cafe and, and beg a loaf of bread from them. I felt yay high, yay small. Oh, I really blew it. And then we left their place and went on to visit some other people, and uh, it started to rain, and it got cool. And I thought, man, I wish I had my sweater. <laughs> so when this was all over, I thought, oh, my father, I now perceive something I didn't know before. I perceive that when you speak to me, even though it's something homely like that, when you speak to me, something arises within me to contradict your voice. Do you know it? Yeah. Do, you, do you experience it? Yeah. We have to begin to recognize this is where the battle is. It's in the mind. And um, we need to know that we have authority over that. But we need to recognize if the Lord has given you a thought, a thought that's good and kind and loving, and something comes up and contradicts that and has the sound of um, carnality, appeals to your emotions like appealing to my uh, feeling of self-esteem. Well, I can't let them think I'm inviting myself. I have my pride to consider. You know, they appeal to, to uh, some, something in your carnal nature. Then you know where the voice is coming from. So just recognize that there is the mind of the spirit and that there is the mind of your carnal reasoning mind. One is contradictory to the other. And we have come to such a place in time, my dear brethren, that God is saying, enough of this. I am going to have you bring this carnal mind to death. And I will have you walk in the mind of the spirit. This is a must. It's a must if you would come into tabernacles. It's a must if you would come into the Melchizedek priesthood. It's a must if you would come into the resurrection. And you need to know the nature of the warfare. That's what I'm here to tell you about. Hallelujah. All glory to God. And so in Revelation chapter 6, there's a word here that is a right up-to-date now word for us. And verse 12 to 14. This is talking about the opening of the seals. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. What do you think that earthquake is happening? Got any earthquake happening here? Is he shaking your heavens and your earth that things are different than they've ever been before? And you don't quite know which way is up? You're having an earthquake. <laughs> That's quite all right. It's a heaven-sent earthquake. <laughs> he needs to do this. And so, if you wonder about this sixth seal, I believe uh, seals one to five have already um, been opened. We're walking in that, and I think we're at the end of the sixth seal. I'm waiting to enter the seventh seal. Hallelujah. And so, in this sixth seal, there is this earthquake. And what happened when the Lord shook our earth? The sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon came as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now let me tell you right now,